Well, hello everyone. Welcome to week number three. I thought I'd put up another really quick uh, video just to wrap up uh, what we had discussed and what we have focused on in week number two, and then look ahead to week number three and talk about some of the things that we'll be looking at, as well as some of the assignments that you'll be doing in week three. So as we had talked about in the week two video, one of the main topics for week two was the idea of power. In the last video, I'd introduced you to this typology of power from John Gaventa, overt power, mobilization of bias, and co-optation. We kind of talked about how those three different types of power work and how it's important to recognize that power is a multifaceted term and not just one, this one monolithic term that we tend to throw around all too often in public administration and political science. And so, again, I think it's important we take that more nuanced approach to what we mean by power and how power is being exercised, because power can be exercised in a variety of different ways. Um, I think I'd also mention to you one of my favorite authors, Mary Parker Follett, and her view of power in organizations, and how she really viewed power as being something that was more of a power with as opposed to a power over relationship between leaders and employees in an organization. That's not really about leaders exercising power over their employees, but rather it's about them sharing power as a resource and helping their employees develop their own repository of power that they can then use for their own development. And so power really, again, is this multifaceted term that can be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, we do know, as we talked about last week, that power can come from a variety of different sources. Sometimes power is formal and it resides within the position the leader holds. Sometimes power is more informal and is found within the charisma or the personality of the leader. We said the good thing about charismatic leadership and power that is derived from the personality of the leader is that it tends to create very strong followers and you have very loyal followers with that type of power. The disadvantage though is that it's very transient in nature and that once that leader leaves the organization, his or her basis of power goes with him or her and does not be retained within the organization, is not retained in the organization. Contrast that then to a more formal authority basis of power where power resides within the office and within the position. And that's a much more permanent type of power than what we see with a more charismatic internal uh, source of power. So, you know, I think power is certainly important in organizations. How power is being exercised is important. And knowing the source of that power and where that power comes from. You know, sometimes we always say information is power. And sometimes you'll see leaders don't want to delegate to their employees. They don't want to give up that power because they see that information as being a very powerful resource for them to have as leaders. We also then talked about how leaders exercise power to try and manage conflict and how conflict is inevitable in an organization, especially an organization that is operated as a democratic organization. The more democratic the organization is, the more likely there will be conflict that will ensue. You don't always want to try and eliminate conflict, but rather as a manager, you want to do the best you can at managing that conflict and trying to make that conflict as productive as possible. So power and conflict were two of the main topics that we looked at last week in week two. Now moving on to week three, we will move forward with a discussion of things such as the goals of the organization and what organizational goals mean for the effectiveness of the organization. And in addition to goals, we'll also look at motivation and we'll look at how leaders motivate their employees and how motivational strategies can lead to employee engagement. So again, to foreshadow those issues just very briefly in this video, goals are obviously extremely important. We can have official goals of the organization, like the goals that we find embodied within the mission of the organization. We can also have what are called operative goals. And the operative goals are the goals that help us eventually achieve our official goals. So operative goals are kind of the you know, day by day, more short term goals that we're trying to achieve. And then the cumulative effect of achieving all those operative goals 
will then be to allow us to achieve our overall goal, our official goal of our organization. Now, goal setting can really be a very difficult process because you want to establish goals for your organization that are attainable, but you also need to have goals that are difficult to accomplish. Because if your goals are too simple, if they're too easy to accomplish, they won't serve as motivating factors for your employees. Employees tend to be motivated by having more difficult goals, and those difficult goals then create this sense of not being accomplished yet, not being able to accomplish the goals, which then creates tension, and that tension for your employees is then released by accomplishing those more difficult goals. So more difficult goals can certainly move your organization forward and motivate your employees to exert that additional amount of effort. Now, there are a lot of ways in which you can develop goals in your organization. One of the most common ways, obviously, is strategic planning. And a lot of you have probably gone through a strategic planning process in your organizations. You know that strategic planning can be something that's difficult to do. You need to have the buy-in of the members of your organization to have an effective strategic planning process. But in your strategic planning process, you need to clarify where you are going as an organization. You need a needs analysis so that you can determine the areas of need within your organization. So what types of things are we deficient in? What types of things are we strong in? Um, what types of skills do we have? What types of skills do we need? Um, how do we relate to our environment? And are we being threatened by our environment or are we being supported by our environment? So this is where things like SWOT analysis, SWOC analysis comes in very handy. What are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats facing your organization? Or with the SWOC analysis, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges that are being faced by the organization? So a SWOT or SWOC analysis can be, it's a very simple process, but it's something that can be very useful in trying to assess the needs of the organization and the types of resources that the organization will need in order to accomplish its goals. So once you establish those goals, long-term and short-term goals, you put together your means for achieving those goals and you put together action plans for how you will engage in certain types of activities in order to make it easier for you to achieve your goals. Again, you're gonna have those short-term goals, those more operative goals, and then you're also gonna have the long-term goals, uh, which are your more official goals. Goal congruence, as we will see this week, is extremely important in organizations. And by goal congruence, we are talking about when the goal of the organization lines up with the goal of the individual employee. So when individual employees and organizations share similar goals, that's goal congruence. And that makes it much easier for us to try and achieve our goals. And the more goal congruence we have, the more likely we will be able to motivate our employees. Now, mo there are a lot of different motivational strategies that we see organizations use, and we'll talk about a few of those this week. But operational strateg um, motivational strategies can consist of a variety of different types of things. Now, you've got your things like operating conditioning, where you motivate employees due to consequences. So you impose consequences for certain types of behaviors. What we have found with operating conditioning is that for the most part, positive reinforcements tend to work better for motivation than negative consequences. We've also found that the way in which we dole out these consequences or reinforcements will have an impact upon how quickly people change their behavior and how enduring that change in behavior is as well. Um, we're, we'll also touch on probably social learning theory where people role model and they learn from others in the organization. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to motivate our employees, but one of the things we do know here in the public sector is that we are much more interested in intrinsic motivators as opposed to extrinsic motivators. So we're much more interested in intrinsic motivators such as a feeling of self-worth, a feeling of accomplishment, 
self-actualization, identification with your job, job identification, recognition for work that's being accomplished. Those are all those intrinsic types of motivators that tend to be much more prevalent among public sector employees than the more extrinsic motivators that we see in the private sector, such as pay for performance, perks, tangible perks. Those are the types of things we tend to see in the private sector. So we tend to see more intrinsic motivators in the public sector for a variety of reasons. One reason obviously is because we're very limited in the public sector in using things like bonus pay and pay for performance. We operate within a position classification system, which means that all of our positions have a classification attached to them. It's difficult for us to reward an individual in one classification for work accomplished when that reward may mean that they're being compensated at a higher level than someone in a higher classification. Typically in the public sector, as you probably already know, in order to pay someone more, we oftentimes have to engage in a reclassification study, get their position reclassified in the step and column system in order for them to get that additional compensation. So from a practical perspective, we are just very limited in the way in which we can motivate our employees with things like pay, with money, compensation. Secondly, I think we can make a pretty credible argument that those who work in the public sector tend to value intrinsic motivators a bit more than they do extrinsic motivators. Now, I'm not saying that they're not motivated by additional pay or would be motivated by additional pay, but those folks who are working in the public sector tend to really value the public service. They tend to have what we political scientists would call a sociotropic type of orientation, meaning that it's not always about themselves as individuals. It's not always about their pocketbook, but rather they're gonna make decisions based upon the impact it's having on society in general. And that's what we call a sociotropic type of motivation. So our public sector employees tend to be motivated more by sociotropic concerns, whereas private sector employees may be a little bit more motivated by the pocketbook consideration, the rational self-interested type of decision-making model. Another reason why it's sometimes difficult to motivate our employees that really ties goals and motivation together is the presence of very ambiguous, unclear goals in the public sector. Now, I don't think there's a whole lot of debate that the goals in the public sector tend to be much more vague and ambiguous than the goals of private sector organizations. And there are a variety of different reasons for that. One reason why our goals are more ambiguous in the public sector is because we receive ambiguous and vague direction from elected officials. So as you know, you know, one of the maxims of public administration that sets it apart from private administration is that public administrators serve many masters. We serve the legislature, we serve the executive, we serve the judiciary. So we have all these different masters that we are receiving dictates from and direction from. Oftentimes those directions are developed in a very vague manner on purpose. So the enabling legislation that creates our agencies and creates our programs tends to be ambiguous. And it's ambiguous for the practical purpose of if you had something that was too specific, a piece of legislation that was too specific, you would never get the agreement of a majority of members of a legislative body on that piece of legislation. So you keep it vague by definition and then you allow the administrators through administrative rulemaking to fill in all the blanks and to come up with all the specific rules and regulations for how that policy or how that law will be administered and implemented. So just the legislative process itself creates ambiguous directives. And so therefore those ambiguous directives then lead to very vague and ambiguous goals in our public agencies. Second problem that we run into is just the type of good and type of service that we create in the public sector. 
our public sector goods and services tend to be harder to quantify. They're much more qualitative in nature. And so when the output that you are creating as an organization is qualitative, it's gonna be much more difficult to measure that output. And so it's gonna be much more difficult for us to measure our ability to meet our goals in the public sector. Well, the big question, and I think I may have told you, and if I haven't told you already in our first video, I'm gonna tell you now, I tell all of my classes, regardless of the topic of the class, I have a favorite question, a favorite answer. The favorite question I have is, so what? The favorite answer is, it depends. Well, here's the so what question. Well, we have vague and ambiguous goals. Well, so what? What are the implications of that? Well, clearly one implication is it's harder to measure the performance of our organizations at our employees when we have very vague and ambiguous goals. But secondly, and of the most importance for this week, is when we have vague and ambiguous goals, they do not motivate our employees. Whenever you have unclear goals and employees are not crystal clear on what they are supposed to do in their jobs and what the organization is there for and what the organization is trying to achieve, then you're gonna run into a situation where they're just not very motivated to achieve those goals. The literature tells us again and again that there is a strong correlation between the clarity of the goal and the motivational level of the employee. Now, there is a misnomer out there where people tend to think, well, public employees are not very motivated. They're not terribly engaged in their jobs. They're just not very motivated to do a good job, especially in comparison to the private sector. We have seen a lot of studies in the recent years, and especially at the federal level. Every year, there is a study done by the Office of Personnel Management that measures the job satisfaction, the level of engagement of federal employees, and the motivational level of federal employees. And I, I will place a copy of that in our Blackboard site. I don't think it's there yet, but I'll put it as a link for this week where you can go through and take a look at the study, the most recent one that's been published from I believe it's 2017, that kind of shows the contrary, that shows that public employees, at least at the federal level, tend to be highly satisfied in their jobs, they tend to be highly engaged, and they also tend to be uh, highly motivated too. Now, there is some disparity between different types of agencies. Some agencies score very, very well in terms of employee engagement, satisfaction, and motivation. Uh, there's a uh, Marine Commission, Marine, I Marine Life Commission, I believe it is, but there's a commission, very small commission at the federal level, made up of 10 to 12 employees, so extremely small, primarily PhDs in marine biology. And the job of the commission is to try and provide direction in terms of ocean health and things like that. They tend to have an engagement level upwards of 96, 97%. So they usually score the highest in the federal government. The lowest scoring agency in the federal government is actually a department. And it tends to be the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Their motivational levels are much lower, but still show that a majority of employees, even with HUD, are highly motivated and are satisfied and tend to be engaged in the jobs that they are doing. So I'll put that study up on our site so you can take a look at it. But another takeaway from that study when it comes to employee engagement is that there is a very strong correlation between the size of the organization and the amount of employee engagement within that organization. And the relationship is, as you might guess, as the organization gets larger, employee engagement levels tend to decrease. So it's the very small agencies that tend to have the highest employee engagement and satisfaction levels and the very large organizations that tend to have the lowest satisfaction and engagement levels. I think it's a really interesting study. I've used it in some other courses that I've taught. So I'll go ahead and put it on our Blackboard site so you can kind of get a sense of at the federal level how motivation and how employee engagement and job satisfaction kind of looks across the federal government for different agencies and departments and commissions at the federal level. But for the purposes of not making this video too long, let me just really quickly 
uh, go through this week and show you some of the things that you're going to be doing. Uh, again, we're looking at things such as goals. We're looking at things such as motivation this week. Uh, you've got your reading, six, seven, and eight in the textbook. Um, there's also an audio file up there. There is the um, a PowerPoint, as always, from Dr. Lane that's on there. And then you have the organizational evaluation worksheet number two. You already did number one previous week. Now you're going to be doing worksheet number two. And then you also have your second journal posting on motivators and inhibitors for productivity, uh, looking at what extrinsic and intrinsic rewards you focus on as a worker, what types of motivators tend to influence your productivity level. So kind of picking up on some of the things we've talked about in this video, some of the things you're going to read about this week uh, from your own personal experience, what motivates you and how motivated are you by different types of extrinsic versus intrinsic rewards. So that in a very large nutshell is week number three. Mm -hmm. I've made the module available for you so you can go in and you can start taking a look at that information. Um, I hope everyone has a great week. As always, if you have any questions, you can either contact me through the Q&A form in the classroom or feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Uh, I will be in town for most of this week. I am leaving town on Friday and then my schedule gets a little bit crazy. So my posting of the week four video may be a little bit delayed for next week because I'm leaving town on Friday, going to San Diego for the weekend. And then on Monday, I'm turning around and getting on a plane and flying to DC. And I'll be in Washington for probably three days. So I should be returning then the following Thursday. I will have access to email. It'll be a little bit limited in terms of my schedule. So if you shoot me an email between, February, between March 22nd and March 28th or so, your response may be a little bit delayed over what you are, are usually accustomed to, and I apologize for that. But I will be able to access the classroom. I also will be able to respond to emails as soon as I get a chance. So again, as always, feel free to ask any questions you have. Otherwise, I certainly hope you have a great week, and I look forward to speaking at you again um, when I do get the chance to put our week four video up. So have a great week, and I'll talk to everyone soon.